Welcome to the Overcoming Mediocrity Podcast, where today's top influencers and entrepreneurs on the rise share empowering stories and ninja tips to become the fuel that ignites a positive change in your life. Our guests don't simply coast through life. They don't let difficult situations stop them. They set big goals, keep their eyes on the prize, and they're joining us today to share insider secrets you can use right now to step into your power and live your purpose. Now, here's your host, Christy Rafino. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Overcoming Mediocrity podcast. I am Christy Rafino, the host of the show, and today I'm really happy to introduce to you my new friend, Mark Stern. Welcome, Mark. Well, it's good. we're not new friends. What are you talking about? Well, no, I'm thrilled to be here. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, semi-new. Um, we kind of were in different groups and communities together, but then we actually hung out in Cabo, and we got to know each other really well, and it was a lot of fun. Yeah, no, it was good. No, I'm thrilled to be here. So thank you for having me. Yeah. So I am going to share a little bit about you with the audience. And then you're going to share a little bit about yourself as you talk about um, why you're so passionate about what you do now. So Mark Stern is a serial entrepreneur and founder of the Custom Box Agency, Virtual Social Box and Teleport QR, which I love that. I hope we have time to talk about that. So prior to becoming an entrepreneur, Mark was a number one rated top tier strategy consultant at Deloitte Consulting, the world's largest consulting firm. Mark holds an MBA from Duke University. Oh gosh, Fuqua School of Business. How do I say that? Fuqua. Fuqua School of Business. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he is a five-time Spartan trifecta holder. S oh, Southwest by Southwest. So SXSW startup mentor and lifetime lover of tacos and barbecues. Uh, Mark currently lives in Austin with, you didn't even mention your most favorite person in your bio, your little Addie. I love that you said that. No, usually it used to be in my bio, but uh, yeah, she is my, I have a little black headed Corgi and she is the CMO of our business. So you'll see on all of our marketing, she has, she's everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> she's usually with me. Like I'll have her this afternoon, but she tends to make a lot of noise in the morning. She with grandpa <laughs> <laughs> with somebody. Um, yeah. So welcome Mark. And I know um, that's a lot of great credentials, but more importantly, there's a reason why you're so passionate about this whole experiential box strategy to help business owners, um, you know, just basically amplify their business. So how did you get it? Like who wakes up in the morning and says, Oh, I'm going to be a box specialist. Oh, it's, it's, it's the funniest thing because I'm like, um, when I was in business school, like, had you told me that, Oh, you're or as a kid, you'll grow up and you'll have a business that creates these box experiences. I would have said, you lost your mind. And I'm from Alabama. So when I tell people from Alabama what I do, um, my parents and everyone, they, I think I just, they basically just assume I'm a, a delivery man, like a UPS delivery man. Yeah. Um, but I'm excited to talk about it. No. So um, uh, thank you for the, the, the intro. But um, this whole business was completely an accident. I was such a child of corporate America. Um, was told, like, here's the pathway to happiness. And, you know, went to high school, graduated college graduated, had the dream job that I wanted. I wanted to do what was called experiential marketing and did marketing in the beverage realm. And then I went and got my MBA at Duke. And uh, after Duke, I joined uh, Deloitte Consulting, worked for a really big corporate American consulting firm. And this is kind of like the pathway to life, you know, and I felt like I checked all the boxes. And then you flash forward to 2012. That's when I graduated. Um, I had $165,000 in student loan debt after graduating business school. We were the class that enrolled after the economic burst. So scholarship was not there. Jobs were just coming back. And I had just committed two years to a big consulting firm. And for anyone who's worked for a big consulting or big tech, they own everything you produce inside the firm and outside the firm. So when all this buzz around like side hustles are smart, like start like a little nest egg and grow that and eventually leave your corporate job. I couldn't do any of that because anything I did was owned by the firm. And you just, it was such a high burn job. I just didn't have time to do anything else. 
So like, that's kind of where I was, was that you're at a crossroads in life that you're like, I'm $165,000 in debt. I'm locked into this job. I can't explore my entrepreneurial spirit. And it took me years to get in the right headspace to feel comfortable making the transition. And it was all a mindset thing. And um, I went, this was off a whim to a conference by um, a group named Mind Valley. I don't know if you've ever heard of Mind Valley. I have actually. And uh, there was a conference that I had no, as corporate as I was, I had no business being there, but it was the first introduction to the digital marketing or the online entrepreneur realm. And um, talk about an experience that you have in life that the world around you kind of shatters and you realize nothing will ever be the same again. That's, that's what that was for me. It was like those moments that like all of a sudden I was shown a different reality yeah. than the one that I and everyone I knew had been exposed to. And it kind of broke me a little bit. Like it really put me in a, in a bad headspace to try and think of like, yeah, you, I thought I was on the right track for my life. There was a massive disconnect that I couldn't pinpoint and started going to every digital marketing conference, buying every course, doing everything, which I couldn't act on because in my corporate job, right, you they own owned cops. everything exactly. I produce. Yeah. So it literally and that doesn't help your creativity, right? Not at when all. When you feel like confined like that and just uh, restricted, that doesn't allow us creatives to get out yeah. and blossom. You truly feel trapped in a box. Yeah, yeah, look so. at that. Uh, but it, it, it was, it was suffocating. It was, um, for me, it took me years. And finally, um, and here's the reality it was 2017. It was the holiday break. I didn't think I would ever leave this job. I was on the verge of being a junior partner and had, um, a premonition and that was it. It was just a premonition. My okay. brain slowed down enough over the holidays that if I don't leave this job, it will kill me. Mm. That was it. It spooked me. And, um, I, w without any rhyme or reason, January 3rd showed up, um, went to my partner and said, I have to go. And I said, I'll finish out the project. I'm on no rush. You can have me as long as you need me. I stayed active for about five months, but you know, you mentioned my dog. The crazy thing about my dog was that the breeder who, um, brought me my dog, I had paid her money about half a year before. And I told her, this is what I want a black headed female tricolored Corgi. And the day I put in my notice at, at Deloitte, was you know driving home i was like send me a sign and I, I can't i can't make this stuff up but like literally opened up my phone when i got back home and the woman posted that she had available a black-headed female tricolor corgi and i called her up and said that's my dog so like oh i got goosebumps how it all, like how it that all like perfect. came yeah. to fruition but i will say to answer your question around why boxes um in the digital age, especially at the age of COVID, you know, I started building a business and building virtual events and a business on training people on how to launch virtual events. This is before COVID. People were calling them summits. I was calling them events. And for me, one of the things that we did was I thought a better virtual experience would be what, what if I had a workshop or an event that I just mail you everything you need? And didn't know what this would translate to, but I started with a publication that I had created I started shipping out. This is something I built in PowerPoint. Like this is not like fancy publication. This is me sitting in PowerPoint and like collecting thoughts and just draw, like super basic, but really cool. And people started taking pictures with the publication, posting them online. And I was like, okay, like the cool. one thing that I'm doing different is sending something physical to a digital experience. And then um, later on, I was like, well, what if I did a whole box set of stuff, not just a, a pamphlet? And created, it was an event called High Ticket Online. I interviewed 12 uh, entrepreneurs on different ways they did high ticket, but then built this toolkit that people could use to plot out their high ticket programs. And that, again, all of a sudden, everyone who received the box started doing unboxing videos and they started showing the pieces off. So all of a sudden, like I'm building this business in virtual events, but what's getting me attention is the physical component right. that was disruptive and innovative in a way that I never thought it was. So now you kind of flash forward to the age of COVID when COVID hit in uh, early 2020, I was growing this business of virtual events and growing this business of doing these box experiences that people were asking me about. And my mentor said, you know, who are you? Are you the box guy or are you the virtual event guy? Because you're confusing the market. And this is to anyone who's listening, if I can give like one just great piece of advice, when I was in corporate America, they celebrated me for being good at everything. 
as a business owner and as an entrepreneur, they don't celebrate you for being the world's best generalist. They celebrate you for being known for something. Yes. Yes. And not the jack of all trades, right? The master of one. Master of one. And it's so it's because consulting, they wanted you to be good at everything. When I went all in on boxes and the reason I chose boxes versus virtual events was virtual events overnight became this bloody red market. Every local right. event expert who no longer had a local event became an expert in um, virtual events. So I was like, the, the, it just didn't excite me. And there was this unknown territory of how to leverage physical and direct mail to transform your business. And that's what started us down this whole rabbit hole of how do we truly own a creative perspective? We're not in the business of swag boxes. We say swag is stuff without a goal. Swag has its place. We want to create intentional experiences that bring physical and digital together in a way that um, you're not seeing currently um, in a way to give your clientele the tools they need to have an easier transformation with your products and services. Right. So basically you left the red ocean and jumped in and created your own blue ocean, right? That's that's it. And it was it, this whole thing has been accidental yeah. and it was never that's like the never way. in a million years, but it was a lot of just things that happened that built up and just. This is why you have to start, like, stop listening with your head and just start listening to what other people are saying. People were reaching out to me left and right about how am I doing these box experiences, but it never crossed my mind that that could become, you know, my, the business opportunity and what we've grown today. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. I have a whole list of questions I want to dive into as we um, really unpack what this all means for us, the entrepreneurs, but we're going to take a quick break. And then we'll come back and we'll kind of get into some of that uh, where you can share your, your wisdom around this. So awesome. Hang, hang tight. Today's episode is brought to you by the Overcoming Mediocrity Project. Are you ready to share your story in a life-changing book with other success-driven women? Then what if you could use that book to get speaking gigs, podcast interviews, and possibly a new client or two? Wouldn't that be great? Well, watch out, chicken soup. Here comes Overcoming Mediocrity. Our proven system can transform your struggle story into a powerful signature message and then as one chapter in an Amazon best-selling book. Our process is simple and economical, and it will bring a lot of eyeballs on you, your business, and your big message to the world. We welcome you to apply to join our project. Just visit us at overcomingmediocrity.org and click on the apply button at the top of the page. We'll see you soon. All right, well, welcome back everybody. This is Christy and Mark Stern and we are talking about boxes and not the kind of boxes that you play with when you're a kid, or not even swag boxes, because if you're an entrepreneur and if you've registered for events and events, you possibly got a box that has a bunch of fun stuff in it. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about experiential boxes. Is that correct, Mark? That's it. That's it. All right. What does that mean? So when we say, let's just start with the word experience. What is experience? Experience is it's what you like literally experience through the senses. We experience life through our senses, touch, taste, sight, sound, smell. When you think of like going to Disney World, like we love Disney World. Disney World is such a master at creating moments and a master at designing experiences because what uh, you are activated on all fronts, what you smell, what you see, what you're touching, what you interact with, they have it mastered. Um, even walking into a movie theater, you have to keep in mind that all the senses are points of sale as well. Because if you walk into a movie theater and you smell the popcorn, Part of that experience is you're going to trigger, I want to buy popcorn and get some soda to take into the theater as well. When you talk about a digital only experience, especially in age of COVID where everything went virtual, digital taps into two senses, what you see and what you hear. Podcasts, what you hear. Scrolling through Facebook or Instagram, what you see. YouTube, what you see and hear. So if you just recognize that like one, the barriers to entry are so low that like, how do you differentiate yourself in the market? Well, if I send you something physical, it brings in a kinesthetic element that a digital only product can't. And oftentimes one of the biggest things you see, here's a good stat, is that um, the, uh, the MOOC, the online learning um, market is expected to be a $325 billion market in 2025. Crazy. Yeah. 
Yet MIT did a study uh, that said that uh, dropout rates for online courses is 96%. So we have this booming market, but 4% success rates. And a lot of the issue for why this is, is because people are starting to doubt the quality and integrity of the content online because there's so much of it. It's so saturated. Right. Right. And so this is where, and part of it is that they overcomplicate like the, the experience to helping people be successful. I make you like, for instance, in a course, I may make you print out the workbooks and like um, go get certain supplies to even get started. If you make me print out something, you're assuming I have a printer, it has paper, it has ink, and it's linked to my computer. The cool thing about a thinking through a curated experience that brings together the physical and digital, I can send you what you need to start to have that experience out of the box right yeah. away. Yep. Yeah. And it's basically taking that person on a journey because mm -hmm. I saw one of your little sample boxes and it was really cool how you put all of the like different elements together and each element by itself doesn't, didn't necessarily mean as much as it did as a whole. Mm -hmm. Right. Is that correct? Kind of the, it yeah. all kind of fits together. It's all part of the journey. It's all part of the story. And I'm glad you said yeah. the word journey because yes. to me, that is the critical thing is like one of the biggest, like for any business, and this is a quick tip, like, uh, have you thought through the experience from onboarding to getting them that outcome? And what truly are the phases that take them every step along the way? A lot of people are like, they buy a service and then it's a bunch of jumble in the middle. And then if you follow it, eventually you may get the outcome. Like, how do we truly create a prescriptive plan? And one, like an easy win for any business, do you have an intentional onboarding process? Because onboarding, we see like, especially with like memberships online, um, especially with high ticket firms, people will uh, refund in the first 30 days because they don't feel set up for success. Mm -hmm. So the cool thing about sending a box experience is if you create, mm -hmm. create a really good onboarding practice um, and literally give them the tools they need to have that quick win right out of the gate, we instantly see attrition rates drop because people are learning how to do this. And this is like take a literally like anything else in life. You know, if you play a video game, oftentimes at the beginning of the game, it's going to teach you how to use the controller to be successful in the game. That's an onboarding process. Mm -hmm. When you go to university, there's going to be an orientation. Um, anything that you do in life, like so many different things. When you play a board game, you want to learn the rules in order to be able to be set up for success to play the game. Like you need a strong foundation about the journey that you're about to go on. Um, and that's one of the things that I see a lot of businesses, they don't have a good prescriptive Here's how I'm going to like set you up for success from this get go. And a good curated boxy experience with a clear journey can help solve that problem. So I think for me, what came to my mind is it goes back to before where you mentioned how important it is for people to find their niche and stick with it. Mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of these experts out there are constantly pivoting, right? They're teaching one thing, they're creating one course and they're doing something else. But if you have your signature program and you create your signature experience for your client and stay focused on that result, and then you create this box experience around that, all that's going to do is make your program even more and more and more successful. It becomes a buzz, right? Everybody's talking about it. Everybody's basically helping you get more clients through this whole experiential process. I love that. 100%. And just to build upon that, like uh, where I see a lot of people instantly, people are like, I have to save a box experience for my high ticket buyers, oh. the people who are spending a lot more money because it's going to cost money to do this. And I always say like, those are easy because they're already indoctrinated. They're already investing with you a high ticket amount. And mm -hmm. it's a smaller number, like oftentimes, sometimes the biggest opportunities. And, and one thing just to kind of orient, orient the listeners on, I think a lot of people think when we say box, it's a big box that has t-shirts and a bunch of stuff in it. We do a lot that's a really small box. Like one of the things that we love to do, I call it small box strategy. It's a box that's a little bit bigger than a book. The amount of experience you can create in something that small, that sometimes the hard cost of the box is 15 to $20 for a really amazing experience. And we know that people based on the size if you set the story right, they're going to put it on their bookshelf and now you're taking up real estate in their home. Yeah, but yeah. I, I mentioned this and, and we have clients that like literally will say, here's the journey you're going on for the year, but here's the first piece and the box is small enough that has yes. the first piece. So we've minimized overwhelm, but then guess what we're going to do? Well, if we know that people tend to drop off at month three or four, we're going to um, 
introduce a second box of the series and a third box of the series or tell people that this is one of four and they have to stay active if they want the complete set. People don't like open loops. People don't like incomplete series, but we can better serve our people by just giving them one piece at a time. And in terms of like where I would introduce it, if you know it's gonna cost you 15 to 20 bucks for the hard cost of a box. When I see people who have memberships that are $47 or $97 per month, um, some of these lower ticket uh, memberships, I'm like, that's where I would introduce the box because you may have hundreds, if not thousands of people buying that lower ticket um, offer to get a taste of you. Yeah. And you can leverage that box experience. For me, I would trade if you had a five figure plus, you know, a high ticket offer on the back end, I would trade that $15 that I'm going to lose in that first month um, uh, in order to hopefully demonstrate that I am your right trusted mentor and I have the resources to take you to the next level yep. and to sell you on that $10,000 plus package. Yeah, honestly, that's kind of what has been going through my mind. I have my Epic Mastery program and I can see uh, if I break it down into the four pieces, the EPIC, I can see how that first one could be completely targeted to that first step of the journey that will not only serve that person really well, but now bring them in to wanting to take that second step with me. Yeah. And, and that's, and the cool thing about this also is like, as your program grows, so some of our programs that have multiple boxes to it, yeah. some are triggered based on timing, some are triggered based on accomplishments that wow. everyone's on their own. So for yes. me, I may be able to blow through the program in a month and be ready for the next piece for the next person. It may take them six months. And the cool thing about it, especially if you have coaches or other mentors involved, just knowing, are you E, are you P, are you I or C, where yes. you are in the equation, instantly tells you, I know where this student is. I know where this customer is in my process. And it gives them goals, right? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, and everybody is, you're almost gamifying the process in a tangible way instead of some, you know, electric confetti going off when you open the screen you actually are getting something in the mail saying yay i accomplished this goal now i'm recharged to go on to do the next goal that is the power so and you said the magic word we love gamification yes. gamification if people aren't thinking about it in their businesses you need to think about how to gamify elements because when you turn it into a game it instantly di differentiates what the experience is and you've set goals for people to achieve um, the example that I give, and this has influenced so much of what we, we do with our clients, um, this was 2015. Um, I did a Spartan race. Spartan's a mud run, an obstacle course race, yep. um, where you're like running through mud and doing obstacles. And it, it, for me, it was uh, the sprint was three to five miles. First, I was like, I've lost my mind. Like, why am I doing this? Um, yeah. And then I did it and I loved it. But what they did really smart was I got a medal for completing the race. But then they said, but do you want to get your trifecta, which means you need to do the next the two next. tiers yeah. races. And so they gave me a third of a medal. They literally um, have a third of a medal. That oh, they I love you. that. That is brilliant. And, and so when I did the super, which was an eight to 10 mile mud run, which I'm like, again, what am I doing? Um, I did it and got the second wedge. And now like to complete the trifecta, I can't have two to two of three pieces of a medal. <laughs> And the constraint, how they gamified it is um, you have to do it in a calendar year. The next thing I know is six months after starting this journey, I'm doing a half marathon mud run to get my last piece. But what it was that I wanted, I wanted the final wedge to complete the series. Yeah. What I got was a transformation to realize that I'm capable of so much more than I ever thought I was. And I did that every year up till COVID, literally five years. So I've done over 15 Spartan races. I've gotten uh, five trifectas. Never in a million years did I think I'd do something like that, but it was literally how they gamify the process that kept me active. And that same methodology, like you can bring to your business. We have clients right now that we're doing this with coins, that that first step of the equation, you send the first box that you're talking about. Yep. I can also include a, a stand that has four notches and I give you your first coin. So mm. what you have staring back at you is three more notches right. in order to complete the series. Right. Sometimes that cheap piece of plastic that has the engravings where you stick the coins in may be the difference to incentivize someone to want to strive to complete the series. And what they're getting as an outcome is whatever the value prop of your program is. Yeah. So how are we incentivizing behavior? Because we are human at the end of the day. We want to be recognized that we want to be celebrated. No, we we want to feel like we're not failures. Yeah, we don't want to be failures, right? Yeah. When whatever that looks like to us, but not finishing something we start and commit to 
there's no way to say that that's not a failure. So no. creating that incentive around that to help that person, like just give them and equip them to be able to finish as they desire to. So I love that. Yeah. Huh. It's making me re rethink a lot of uh, kind of the way I have my program mapped out. So this is great. Uh, I mean, this is the fun thing, though. This is kind of what I, I tell clients, like, stop thinking about like the problem with swag when people are like, oh, let me send you a mug. Eh, Oftentimes yeah. I'm like, I'm like, like, it's OK to send a mug or a water bottle. But I need like if you're going to send a water bottle to someone, I hope you say, hey, like if like I have a lot of clients that train people on how to grow their business. Um how um like if you have a ritual that is when you're stressed out you go for a walk and you bring your water bottle and you just breathe in fresh air and sip on water bottle for 15 minutes send people your water bottle not just a random water bottle mm. give them your water bottle and now not only do they have your exact tool they also have the ritual that you've given them that's a lot more powerful than here's a random coffee mug uh here's a random widget in the box yeah. um i want story i want to tie it back to what you're already talking about yeah. I want it to purely represent you and the 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 adventure that you're sending people on. And that's just a component. That's how I would leverage um, turning swag into something more intentional. And then if we talked about QR codes, you could take it to a whole nother level. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, this has been really great so far. Um, do you want to dive into QR codes or is there something you want to focus on around this uh, strategy, how people can maybe adopt something like this into their business? and how you could possibly support them. Yeah, let's let's start with that too. So where would I ever start on this is I think it's really important. This is something I learned from my friend Holly Flick. Um, and this is something that when we truly think about the, how, how to design that customer experience, like we, the first anchor, the simplest framework. And if you start to think about your business through this framework, I'm telling you it's transform mine and it will transform yours. We think through everything through is this an acquisition play so customer life cycle phase one mm -hmm. you acquire customers clients mm -hmm. you may acquire jv partners or sponsors phase two delivery of your products and services so now that i've acquired you as a customer now i have to fulfill upon my promise um uh so this is a different way to think through like what is that experience once they're in because it's not a sales experience anymore now it's a delivery experience and then the third, and this is kind of where the, the biggest opportunity is, which is retention. Mm -hmm. How are we thinking through a retention strategy? How are we re-engaging? How are we upselling or supporting our clientele and or customers in a different way? So everything we do is through the lens of what is our goals around acquisition? What is our goals around delivery? And what is our goals around retention? And with boxes and even flat mailers, when we think about the direct mail channel, we always ask the question of, um, is, this, is the goal of this piece acquisition i'm using a box because we're doing a free plus ship box right now which is okay. an acquisition play we're leveraging yeah. flat branded mailers um to further indoctrinate people to get them at point of sale that's a different strategy on how to leverage direct mail delivery is exactly what we talked about most of this session um delivery as you join my program is part of simplifying onboarding or getting people giving people from the get-go the tools they need to minimize attrition and make them feel supported and just kind of reiterate like why they made this investment different way to leverage boxes and this is kind of where you can paint the journey of where they're going mm -hmm. and just give them piece that they need um for that first major milestone and then retention um this is where like recognitions like awards are really powerful yeah um click funnels has a two comma club award it's if you generate a million dollars using a funnel part of the reason that's a retention play is if you stop paying for their software and you make a million dollars, you can't get the award. You have to be an active customer. So you've given people a goal to strive for. And when they hit it, uh, guess what? They're going to not only let you walk on stage at their live event, but they're going to mail you in a box your award. And what are you going to do? You're going to do an unboxing experience. So like recognitions and awards, I see you, I celebrate you. That is a retention play. And it's all different ways you, that you can leverage it. But I mean, what do they do? They ask for the testimonial right away. They introduce other ways that they can serve you. How do I, and that's just the power. So we think through all like delivery of box or experience and strategy. Is this acquisition? Is this delivery? Is and this retention? retention. Okay. I love um, that. Uh, with, uh, and so that's one step. And then the other step I would just say is if you don't have a documented journey, like you want to make sure as you think through your customer journey, every step and every encounter that you have 
is it a positive experience? Is it a neutral experience or is it a negative experience? And part of it is like when you ask for money, it typically trends neutral to negative. How do you make that experience then coupled with some positive experiences to reinforce behavior? So the simple exercise of just documenting step by step how you're interacting with your customers and clienteles, it instantly can say like, this is where it's, it's always eye opening when we do it. But it's eye opening in the sense of like, oh, we have like two negative experiences or what is perceived negative. Um, how do we turn this into a positive or how do we take the negative to a neutral or even a good experience? Right, um, right. Yeah. I mean, sometimes we get okay with the neutrals instead of looking at them and saying, you know what, even we don't even want neutrals. We want to have a positive experience all the way along. So that way they stay focused and they stay with us. And this is why it's important to engage your customers and ask them, you know, yes. what do you think about this? Because they'll tell you, oh, this works great. I've had my customers tell me, oh, you know, like we had how we were doing um, invoicing was a pain point. It was a negative experience. We completely revamped mm. it to make it more seamless for them. Um, and then how we celebrated them became an experience around it. So that's just kind of thinking through what are the different touch points as we go through this? Because I want as yeah. positive of an experience as possible. Yeah. I think that's the only thing I would add on that. We can talk about QR codes too. Well, I want to back up though, because you mentioned about having a negative sales experience. And I think everybody that maybe heard that can relate a little bit, either from the, you know, the purchaser side or the person trying to sell somebody into something, um, which we shouldn't be trying to sell. We invite, but the bottom line is how can we, can you share like maybe one Sure. strategy that we can use to take that experience and move it out of the negative into a neutral or positive? Well, I'll tell you what I was doing, which I should have seen the writing on the walls, but like it just was so just to, like, first and foremost, most of your clientele are for me, I'll, I'll, I don't want to say this for everyone, but for me, um, I like just automatic payment set up so I don't have to see it. So um, what we were doing, so you can all learn from our mistake is we have three different areas in the business that um, uh, typically clients incur expenses for. One is our services. The second area is shipping. Um, every month it's different because if you ship um, a little this month or a lot next month, if you ship um, domestic versus international, like the shipping rate's a variable rate. Yeah. And then because we, we have hard goods, the hard cost of the boxes are a different variable expense. So we used to send a, three different invoices, one in the month for our services. And then twice a month we would invoice for hard cost of goods. And then once a month again for fulfillment. So we're talking yeah, four invoices yeah. that like, in terms of a business perspective, when you're not thinking about experience, you're like, um, <laughs> like, Oh, I, we just need, we like, we, yeah. we need to get paid for these services. Well, and, um, and from and our perspective, we're like, well, we're getting another invoice. Why are we getting another one? We just paid fine. that, you know, it's. You go through an exercise like this and you're like, we are hitting them four times. So every other day, it feels like we're invoicing you every single month. And that was definitely not the intention. And so like, here's what we're doing, like to take this into a positive. The first thing we did, because uh, one of the issues we were having was there were so many of the clients were having trouble keeping touch with them. And so then invoices were going late and whatnot. And it was all because of us. It had nothing to do with our clients. Um, we uh, streamlined and consolidated. So we created a process in place to have only one invoice that would always trigger on the fifth of the month. So everything's getting consolidated. Where we're going, we're now, so that's taking it from the negative experience it is and bringing it up to say on the fifth of every month, you can expect the one invoice for us. Um, where we're going is we're building out our own custom platform now. So how do we start to make this a little bit more into neutral to positive um, where you can just build your credit card in and, um, it just runs automatically and you have the transparency to see kind of see like for me, the yeah. best example I can give is um, a hotel. When you go into a hotel, you can put down your credit card and get something at the gift shop and then go to the restaurant for breakfast and watch a movie in your room. And it just aggregates and you can see in like real time. Transparency is something that's really powerful. And I don't think people offer enough transparency, but the more transparent I am with uh, our clients and for delivery, we're a hundred percent transparent the more they feel ownership of it and uh, feel like they're in control of it and have the predictability around it to create it into a more seamless experience. So eventually where it's going to be is similar to a hotel. This is what we're about to roll out. You get a statement where you can review the statement. We'll answer any questions and then it's just run. So Love that's it. kind of where we're trending towards. It's much better than four invoices in a month. <laughs> Love it. 
All right, well, we're running out of time, but I do want to not leave out the QR code uh, system that you have because I have used QR codes for a long time before they were COVID popular. Um, I know COVID brought that to like a lot of people, even my grand, you know, my stepfather knows how to use a QR code when he goes to a restaurant now to pull up the menu. Um, and, but yours is completely different and I love it. Yeah, no, it's, it, this is where like, you know, thank you COVID for, you know, introducing the world on how to use QR codes and, um, they may be ugly, but they are hyper functional. And Absolutely. when we think about the, like experience design, I'm in the world of like blending, making a more seamless interaction between physical and digital QR codes. Um, Typically, what people don't know about QR codes is there's two types. It's either static, which means once you create the QR code, you can never change where it goes, or it can be dynamic. A dynamic QR code is a QR code that any point in time, you can log into whatever platform you use to produce the code, and you can change it. And so when you put, um, when you think about that through the lens of a digital marketer, and this is kind of the platform we built out with Teleport QR, how do we make this work for us? And what we ultimately did was two different use cases to build out. One is what we're calling uh, leveraging QR codes that we call teleport campaigns. You can literally, and this is, there's, you, can, you can do this with a variety, a variety of different ways, but the way that we do it is you can say, I have a QR code. I'm going to stick it on a water bottle. I'm going to stick it on a magnet that you're going to tell your clientele to put on their fridge. You're going to stick it on a sticker that you tell them to put on the laptop, whatever the use case is, but you have the ability to change it out. So I've clients that do this with their music playlist they listen to each month when working. I have clients that are like, how do I send you like um, an update for that month of the things that you need to know? If you're an accountant, you can say, here are the things that are relevant for the month of February. Here are the things that I need. And just have that one little message that they keep this piece. Love and we that. call it, you're taking something that's um, normal and making it living. It's always evolving and always changing. Um, the other use case that we talk about is what we call a carousel campaign. Imagine having a water bottle that has a QR code and saying like uploading, I'll use as like days of the week, seven, uh, if you're in the workout space, you can upload a different workout for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, meditation, a different mindset message for each day of the week. But say, I want you to change it every 24 hours. And once you upload the seven pieces of content, it'll just switch from the Monday message to the Tuesday message. And then at the end of the week, go back to the top. You can set all that through automation with a QR code, and it literally can take something that's static and turn it into this living piece that people are constantly keeping and um, re-engaging with again and again. Um, but there's so many different applications from a business perspective, and the best part about it is every phone, Android or iPhone, you turn up the phone, you can just yep. scan it, not to download an app. I, I, yeah, time. I actually do that with my business cards now. And it doesn't, I have one side that's got my contact information. The other side is my current free gift that I'm offering. And it always changes, but the QR code stays the same. So um, there's just so many ways that that can be used. So really? um, love, thank you for sharing. All right. Well, you do have a gift um, that you want to share for the audience to be able to not only uh, connect with you, but learn how to apply some of these custom box strategies for their business. Yes, yes. So um, the gift I'd love to give is um, we created this set of custom box blueprints, 10 different blueprints for entrepreneurs. Um, and so you'll find in the show notes, you'll be able to find the URL where you can access it. But it's a great way that, you know, depending on what you're doing, we took 10 different use cases and how people are leveraging a physical box in ways that you can strategically think about introducing into your business. So it's a really great uh, resource. Um, and of course, you know, if you have any questions, people can always reach out to me. Yeah. So uh, Mark's contact information, as well as the link for 10 done for you custom box blueprints um, will be in the show notes below on whatever platform you are listening to this episode. And I want to thank you, Mark. This was a lot of fun and very informational. Yeah, thank you. It's so good catching up with you. Yeah, you too. Well, thanks everybody for joining us today. If you learned something from Mark, uh, we really encourage you to share with somebody else because not only will that be helping them, but you will learn and retain more of what you learned by teaching somebody else. And of course, if you like our show, please go to whatever platform you listen and show us some love, you know, give us a review, rate us, subscribe, do whatever you can to uh, stay connected for all future guests 
um, the more reviews we get, we, it really helps us ensure we bring on, you know, amazing people like Mark, and it helps us to just kind of give us a greater reach out there in the world. So thanks everybody. And thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Overcoming Mediocrity podcast, where we believe that everyone can have the business and life of their dreams once they've learned the art of mastering their story. Mastering our stories is the key to everything we want in life. Our stories can either hold us back or they can propel us to new heights. We can choose. You can choose. Choose to overcome mediocrity with us. Let's achieve greatness together. To learn more, visit www.overcomingmediocrity.org. And don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast.